Today, uh, we will take you through the development process of aircraft propulsion, the early years of the development in which the various kinds of propulsive devices were thought of. Some of them were uh, actually created uh, as a, some kind of a prototype, but many of them never quite flew and we will uh, go on to the Wright brothers when the aircraft flew for the first time and what happened thereafter, how the aircraft engines actually developed over a period of almost 150 years. The first aircraft uh, that flew was nearly 150 years back uh, that did not fly actually, but was created uh, nearly about 150 years back. Uh, one of the creations was by Felix du Temple de la Croix, uh, who had what was called a monoplane at that time. And the early ideas were those that resembled that of a bird. This particular picture, as you can see here, it has uh, wings very much like a bird, a tail plane that resembles that of a bird. And this is uh, the body in which somebody or some things could be placed. You can see the tail the, again that resembles that of a bird and the side view which resembles almost that of a boat in which something or somebody could probably sit or be placed over there. And then of course, you see the propeller. This is the concept that was created nearly 150 years back that to fly a craft like this through the air, you would need a propeller like device to make it move in air. And this is a side view of the propeller, which gives the first impression of what mankind thought a flight craft could possibly be. And this was nearly 150 years back. The idea that you need to have thrust created by some kind of a propulsor was created around that time and it required that uh, if an aircraft is flying, the craft by studying the birds and many other such flying uh, objects, uh, people realize that you need to create lift and the idea at that time was that you create lift by designing a particular kind of aircraft that typically would resemble something like a bird or one kind of bird or the other. However, to do that, you need a certain amount of force to overcome what is also known as drag. And this is due to the resistance of the air in which the craft flies. Now, when the craft is flying, this resistance is continuously active on the body of the craft and this resistance of course, also would uh, change a little depending on the mode of flight. And during these various modes of flight, you need to create thrust that on a continuous basis uh, overcomes this resistance or air resistance and keeps the craft flying at certain predetermined speeds in a certain predetermined mode. And this creates finally, the aircraft motion. Now, unless you have these balance of forces, the lift which should overcome the weight of the craft and a thrust created by a propulsor, which on a continuous basis must overcome the drag, it is not possible to fly. This is the minimum requirement for a craft to fly. And our business in this course is to look at how the thrust is created by propulsor, uh, which propels the aircraft through the air and various kinds of engines that create the propulsive power that finally creates the thrust. The early few uh, devices that were uh, created, but were in the designers drawing board. Uh, one of them was by uh, George Cayley. Now, George Cayley is quite often uh, credited with being the father of modern uh, aeronautics and he created much of the science that is uh, used even today for understanding the aircraft flight. And what he created was uh, a craft that uh, looks something like this okay? and uh, it had a small boat again and a big wing which helps the creation of the lift and then again a tail plane 
uh, that uh, is necessary uh, like a bird to balance the flight. Now, this is what uh, something like this is what he uh, conceived at the time of creating the science of aeronautics, uh, which is laid down in many uh, books even today. A little later after that, a gentleman called Samuel P. Langley created uh, another kind of craft. Now, this had uh, two uh, wings, one above the other and is often referred to as a biplane as opposed to the first one, which is often referred to as a monoplane. Now, monoplane had one wing on each side, so two wings on two sides. This had four wings, so two on each side in a uh, symmetric manner and this was a little later in late 19th century and this was what uh, first uh, attempt to create something that could possibly fly. One of the reasons one supposes that you need two wings was to create sufficient lift to make the craft balance the weight and to do that uh, they had to create uh, two sets of uh, wings on each side and as a result of which you could also see there are two sets of uh, tail planes at the rear, uh, which is not exactly what the birds do, but at that point of time people had realized that you cannot have a craft which exactly looks like a bird, you need to create something different and that difference is what appeared as biplane. Now, Samuel Langley's uh, biplane uh, was attempted to be flown. However, this particular attempt, uh, this picture shows that the first attempt at this uh, flight was unsuccessful and as soon as uh, the craft took off from a ramp on a water body, it immediately thereafter crashed onto the air body. Uh, one of the reasons possibly was that the power available was not sufficient for the craft to balance its uh, drag in the air. As a result of which, a lot of people looked at various kinds of powering device the device that would finally propel the craft through the air and provide sufficient power on a continuous basis. Now, this required them to look at creating engines that would drive the propeller. By that time, it was known that you have to have a propeller to make an aircraft move in air. The question was, what kind of uh, engine do you require? to make the propeller create sufficient thrust. Now, one of the first attempt was by uh, uh, Loren and he created uh, what uh, can be called kind of a uh, jet engine, but it was based on the piston engine concept which was prevailing at that time and had already appeared in market. And this means that uh, a piston would be moving like this and would uh, expel the gas. Uh, as you know probably every second stroke and as a result of which this ga gas ex uh, being expelled or ejected would create a, a kind of a jet action which again as per Newton's third law which we studied in the last class would give a reaction and provide the thrust which means that you would get a thrust every second stroke of this piston. This was the concept created by Lorraine and as a result of that, Loren, what he did, he re quickly realized that a single piston quite often would not be sufficient to create sufficient thrust and hence he lined up six of them one after another in line, so that six of them could produce thrust. Also, there is a possibility that he could time the uh, uh, piston stroke such that they do not actually eject the hot gas simultaneously it could be uh, time to eject them in a manner so that only two of them eject at one time or it could be uh, timed in a manner that all six of them eject at the same time depending on the amount of thrust that needs to be created. This engine of course, was a concept. It was uh, never made and certainly never flew. The next patent that uh, Loren actually uh, went for was a little more simplistic and he went for uh, a straightforward what we call jet engine in which the air enters the chamber uh, and then uh, there is a fuel burning that happens over here and then the hot gas is expelled through a nozzle and through in a jet. And this again as per Newton's third law creates the act reaction that would 
uh, helpfully propel the aircraft through the air. So, this was a concept created by Laurent in 1913 for which he actually took a patent. So now, thereafter, a little thereafter, uh, there was another concept of uh, jet engine. Uh, this was in 1921 and around this time, uh, a gentleman called uh, Guilame uh, patented uh, a concept which uh, supposedly looks like a jet engine. It has a concept very similar to present jet engines, which we will look at in detail a little later. It had compressors and then it had turbines and as a result of which, it was supposed to create a jet thrust. However, as far as all the records go, this kind of engine was never quite materialized and certainly never flew. The one engine that definitely flew and created the so called history of the first flight was the Wright's engine. Now, this engine was uh, again quite simple. It had four uh, uh, cylinders and these four cylinders uh, actually powered one particular shaft and this shaft uh, powered the propeller which flew the Wright brothers plane uh, simply called flyer. And this is the details of one of those pistons which has all the components and those who are familiar with the typical piston engine would find all the components of the piston engine over here. You have the air intake and uh, you have the intake uh, manifold and uh, then you have the combustion chamber etcetera. All the components that one is familiar with, you would find this here. This was a standard piston engine and what they did, they had enough uh, calculation to back them up and they realized that you need a minimum of four engines to create sufficient power to power their propeller and this is what they had put on their craft, which flew for the first time in 1903. Now, this was the craft. This is a historic photograph, which some of you may have seen and this shows that the Wright brothers uh, flying uh, for the first time in the history of mankind in beach called Kitty Hawk in North Carolina, USA. And this is the flight in which uh, Orville uh, Wright uh, was flying and Wilbur Wright was standing over here. On the same day uh, in the morning, uh, they flew four times one after another, each brother taking uh, his turn and uh, out of the four, three of the flights are recorded as the first three flights of the human uh, kind. Uh, now, this had the engine which we just seen and it had the propellers which we will have a look at. Now, this is the craft which is uh, been preserved in uh, a museum in Washington DC, uh, the Smithsonian Institute uh, Museum and if you people go there, you would be able to see the craft uh, hanging over there even today. As you can see here, it, it was a biplane as we were discussing. It had two wings okay, and it had uh, two uh, tail planes. Uh, in fact, they were in, uh, in front and you could see here a person actually lying down. So, Orville Wright was actually f uh, lying down on, uh, on the aircraft because the, there was nearly no place for him to sit there. Okay? And uh, this you can see the craft from another uh, picture, uh, which in which the two, play, uh, two uh, wings uh, are very clearly seen and the two tail planes are also seen. As we have discussed, this was part of the aircraft design, which uh, Wright brothers took a long time to perfect um, before actually they flew. And then now you can see the propellers which they used uh, in the 1903 flight and the propellers they used later on, a little later uh, around 1910. And over the years, the shape of the propeller which they used actually changed a lot. The propeller you can see here is. Uh, it's a, it's a simpler propeller. Uh, it's a paddle type. Uh, here, the propeller, as you can see, 1910, is a little more twisted, far more twisted, uh, bigger in size, and probably has much better uh, shape uh, for creation of thrust. Uh, so there was evolution of propeller, even with the Wright brothers, over a period of seven, ten years, in which they were involved in the uh, various kinds of flying crafts. 
There is a historical claim made by uh, a gentleman called Gustav Whitehead that uh, two years, four months and three days before the successful flight of the Wright brothers, a monoplane actually took to the air on August 14, 1901. That is nearly two and a half years before the Wright brothers uh, flight. Uh, somewhere in US in Connecticut uh, carrying and it was carrying its inventor Gustave Whitehead and it is reported to have flown by about half a mile which would be far more than what the Wright brothers flew. What the Wright brothers flew for example in its flight was uh, the distance which is now recorded as equivalent to the wingspan of today's Boeing 747. So, it was a very small hop, so to say, but the flight uh, claimed by Gustave Whitehead or his uh, uh, successors uh, later on uh, claims to have been a flight of uh, nearly half a mile. Uh, there is no record except for this particular picture. It was supposed to be a monoplane resembling that of a uh, 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 same picture that we have seen for Felix de Temple's uh, monoplane. So, somewhere 50 years after Felix Dutemple's uh, monoplane, uh, somebody, a gentleman named Gustave Whitehead is reported to have created a similar monoplane and actually flew it. However, this has not been scientifically accepted and uh, as far as all the historical scientific records are concerned, the first flight is credited to the Wright brothers. And what we see now is that uh, all the flights uh, that were uh, recorded over a period of first 50 years of flight all flew with propellers as the only means of propulsion, which means that jet engine as we know today were, were not the uh, means through which propulsion was done. It was propellers all the way for over a period of half a century. In fact, according to the records uh, in various uh, uh, scientific uh, uh, recording uh, manuals, uh, sometime after World War I, uh, a high powered committee uh, in US went into the uh, decision making whether uh, jet propulsion could be used for various kinds of flights. And uh, they came with the decision that jet propulsion was really not possible within the foreseeable future and hence uh, they entrusted uh, NACA that is the national administration civil of civil aviation which created this which was created in US uh, with the creation of a large number of propeller blades. And these propeller blades uh, were created by uh, NACA uh, in between the two world wars. Um, as we shall see later on, by the second world war, uh, jet propulsion had actually come into being and uh, the prediction made by the so called high powered body had proved to be uh, erroneous. We will come to that in a few minutes. Let us go through the development of propellers. Now, propellers what they do is they use airfoil shapes. Now, airfoil shapes were created as we have seen. Uh, as we know by George Cayley nearly 150 years back and it was proven that uh, many of the birds and fishes do have uh, these kind of aerofoil shapes that allow them to move through the uh, air or water in case of fishes uh, very smoothly. So, that shape is what uh, today we call aerofoil shape and this is what is used in the propellers also propeller uses the shapes and as the propellers rotate, uh, as per the shape characteristics, they create lift and a component of the lift is then utilized as thrust. Now, this uh, thrust is created in a direction which is perpendicular to the plane of rotation of the propeller and this is to be designed into the propeller. So, it is necessary that person who designs a propeller for a particular aircraft 
is knowledgeable about the science of uh, a propeller, so that when he creates a propeller for a particular aircraft, the propulsive action is created exactly perpendicular to the plane of rotation that meets the demand of that particular aircraft. Uh, propellers can be uh, broadly in two types, one that pulls the aircraft from the front, that is its position at the front of the aircraft, either at the nose of the aircraft or mounted on the wings at the front of the wings and these are called tractor type propellers. There are the other types where sometimes the propellers could be mounted on the rear of the aircraft, which could be at the rear of the fuselage uh, or body of the aircraft or at the back of the wings and it could uh, actually create thrust from the rear of these bodies and they are called the pusher type as if they are pushing their craft from the rear. So, these are the two kinds of propellers that have been around for quite a long time. Most of the propellers that we see are the tractor types, but there are quite a few pusher type pr uh, propellers that have also uh, been used over a period of last 100 years. These are the various propeller blade aerofoil shapes created by uh, Naka uh, more than 60 years back. Um, as you can see, these shapes are so many, there are more than 100 shapes over here and they have served the purpose of uh, creation of literally hundreds and thousands of propellers uh, that uh, fly various aircraft around the world. Uh, so, this was the basis uh, or the beginning of creation of propellers. There are a number of uh, companies who are specialized in using these aerofoil shapes for creating the propellers. Let us quickly take a look at how the propeller actually operates, because that is what make, made the aircraft fly for nearly half a century. Uh, in fact, propellers are being used even today for flying many craft. So, the history of propellers flying the aircraft is more than 100 years old and they are still active in flying many aircraft. So, let us take a quick look what the propellers actually do. The propellers actually, uh, if you look at the picture over here, they are uh, mounted, let us say, somewhere at the nose over here, which is what we would call a tractor type of a propeller and by virtue of its rotation and the aerofoil shape that is uh, given to it, it actually sucks the flow from the front and then it pushes it behind. Okay? So, this suction of the air is aided by the motion of the aircraft. So, as soon as the aircraft starts moving, the motion of the aircraft allows the air to move into the propeller and as the propeller rotates, it also applies the suction. So, when the aircraft is moving in air, the suction of the propeller is expected to match the motion of the aircraft, so that the amount of air that is going through the propeller is actually matched between the propeller and the aircraft movement. Now, when that happens, the flow through the propeller then uh, goes through, uh, let us say, a, a disc like this, which is what we would call the swept area of the propeller. And then, as it goes through, it acquires a little bit of extra uh, energy or extra momentum. This momentum difference, as we know from Newton's uh, second law, provides the thrust. So, this is the momentum of the jet that is being pushed by the propeller. This is the momentum of the air that is coming into the propeller and this provides the thrust that makes the aircraft move. This thrust must balance the drag that is experienced by this entire aircraft. So, this propeller matches the entire drag created by this entire including the drag of the uh, engine uh, and the propeller itself. So, it is the only thrusting body mounted on an aircraft. If you look at uh, the, uh, a typical propeller, this is a typical propeller, it would look something like this. There are various kinds of propellers, various shapes. We will probably have a chance to go into it later on in this course, but in this particular uh, uh, diagram, as you can see, there is propeller shape which this is the tip of the propeller okay, uh, which is what you would see somewhere over here and this is the root of the propeller which is at the uh, 
core of the propeller and is connected uh, to the shaft which comes out of the engine okay and this shaft goes inside over here and quite often this shaft is covered by a nice what is known as a nose cone to make it aerodynamically smooth and that is in front of the propeller. So, flow goes over the nose cone and then enters through the root and then flows over the body of the aircraft. Now, each if you take a cross section of the propeller over here, just any anywhere you would probably see a shape like this and this is the aerofoil shape. And as we have seen there are so many kinds of aerofoil, so many shapes of aerofoil that could be used. Typically in one single propeller all the way from here to here, we would call this let us say the working part of the propeller which creates a thrust. You could probably see various propeller aerofoil shapes. So, the aerofoils that are used in a propeller from root to the tip of the propeller actually change. There are various kinds of aerofoils. So, propeller near the root typically would be a thick propeller whereas, the propeller near the tip would typically be a very thin uh, propeller. Uh, let us take a quick look. Some of the thick propellers uh, airfoils that you see here are likely to be used near the roots. So, this is how uh, typically uh, uh, you, you probably have a root propeller here and then slowly they become thinner and as you go toward the tip you would probably have a thin airfoil like this. So, one such set each such set probably could serve the purpose of one propeller and that is how the propellers are ut utilized, uh, uh, aerofoils are utilized in a propeller for creating the thrust. These are the various kinds of propellers that you would probably see today. If you go around, um, this is for example, a propeller that is after it is being made, the propeller needs to be uh, proven and uh, one of the means of proving it is to actually test it in a wind tunnel. Uh, a wind tunnel actually is, is just a land based grounded uh, facility in which various bodies can be put for uh, aerodynamic testing and propeller is also one such um, element that can be tested inside a wind tunnel and inside the wind tunnel you test the aerodynamic capability of the propeller, you measure the thrust that it is creating and as I have uh, mentioned before, it is necessary that you have exact uh, estimate of the thrust that the propeller would create, because when the aircraft is flying in air, the exact matching is an absolute necessity. In If there is any mismatching, remember the aircraft is not going to fly. If the thrust falls short of the drag, the aircraft is going to fall and uh, if there is any passenger, they are going to be hurt or they are going to be killed. So, it is absolutely necessary that the thrust of the propeller is very accurately predetermined even before it has flown. You can see here a propeller. Uh, now, this is a propeller where you can see here you have four blades. Now, this is a propeller where you can see you have three blades. So, many of the propellers that fly quite often have three blades. Now, this is a tractor type of propeller where the uh, propeller is, in, is at the nose of the aircraft, in front of the aircraft. This is a, uh, an aircraft in which the uh, propeller is the rear and what we call the pusher kind of a propeller. So, it is at the rear of the propeller at the tail of the, uh, of the aircraft um, and this is a, a typical design in which it was for thought that putting the propeller at the nose may not be an appropriate thing to do for this particular design. Whereas, this particular aircraft design accommodates the propeller right at the nose and it is a tractor type of a propeller. Now, to run a propeller, you need engines. As we have seen the 100 years back, the kind of engines that everybody was familiar with were the piston engines, which were already powering the automobiles and other vehicles moving on the surface of the earth. Uh, they were also powering various kinds of engines that powered the boats that uh, went over the waters. Now, this kind of engine uh, had certain specific requirements. To make an engine that will go inside an aircraft and will fly with the aircraft needed that they should be very light, 
they should create sufficient power to power the propeller, which should create thrust to fly the aircraft. And the, one of the prime requirements of anything that goes on aircraft that it has to be light and it has to be very compact and very small in size. Now, this was a requirement that was specific to the aircraft engines and as a result of which the engine arrangement needed to be looked into. So, what people did they looked at various kinds of arrangements. If you have pistons let us say lined up one after another okay, in line those are simply called inline engines. All these pistons uh, would drive uh, you know one single shaft over here and this is your piston drive. So, the, the piston uh, movement could be timed such that there is a continuous power supply to the sh uh, shaft which of course, uh, drives the propeller. The other way of doing it is what is known as the opposed cylinder. That means, instead of having all the pistons on one side and lining up them up one after another to get certain amount of aggregate power, you have let us say two pistons or two cylinders on two sides okay, powering a central shaft. Okay. So, you have two pistons on two sides and they are timed in a such a manner that the power stroke of the two are uh, staggered in time. Uh, another variant of this is to have um, opposed piston within let us say one uh, body of a cylinder. So, you have two pistons and uh, it is actually um, powering on two, two shafts one on this side one on that side. Quite often we shall see later on that they would go on to power a single propeller. The other arrangement which people uh, came up with is simply called the V type, where the pistons are arranged in a V formation and uh, they again power the central shaft over here. In this V formation, you can again put them in line like this single engine. So, you can have V engines lined up one after another or one behind the other and so you could for example, have two engines in V formation or you can have four engines, you can have six engines, you can have eight engines or you can have 12 engines uh, lined up uh, in line in V formation. Uh, many of the modern uh, uh, aircraft do actually have up to 12 engines lined up to supply the aggregate power to uh, run the propeller. The other way of uh, uh, looking at uh, power generation is to have uh, let us say X type, where you have four uh, of these pistons powering a central shaft. And again, the timing of the four pistons are such that uh, this uh, central shaft is continuously being supplied with power and which runs the propeller. So, you can have four of them now lined up and then you can have four and then four engines doubled up. You can have eight of them lined up creating power to uh, run the propeller. If you have more than four, one of the ways of doing this is to have a radial arrangement, so that you can arrange them around in a circular form formation. You can have five of them, uh, typically you can have uh, seven of them or nine of them uh, and then you can again double them up. That means, you can have uh, two sets in, in uh, line with each other. Uh, you know, So, instead of a single piston you can have radial arrangement in line at least two of uh, two uh, sets in line. So, that you can have total of 10 uh, cylinders or uh, 14 cylinders or, or 18 cylinders powering one single central shaft. The other arrangement is of also simply known as H type which again uses four cylinders and uh, this time it is trying to power two uh, shafts. Uh, to create uh, power uh, that is supplied to the propeller. These multi cylinder arrangements for aircraft propulsion were created essentially to go into the aircraft. The various cylindrical arrangements that we are uh, looking at were created essentially for uh, the aircraft uh, power plants. Now, as we have seen in the earlier uh, pictures, these aircrafts have shapes these shapes are created by the aircraft designer to create lift, to create minimum drag 
and of course, to, uh, to house a passenger or a passengers to fly in the aircraft. Now, uh, once you create this shape that is supposed to create minimum amount of drag, your engine needs to be somehow accommodated within this shape. This is the important issue that your engine arrangement must conform to the shape of the aircraft that has been created. So, various kinds of engine arrangements were created to go inside these shapes. For example, this tractor type of propeller, it has a shape of the front of the body inside which one can guess the engine is housed. We can only see the propeller here and this engine must have a certain amount of uh, space in a certain shape and that shape is likely to be, uh, let us say, accommodated by something like this or something like this. Okay. That particular aircraft is most unlikely to have a radial kind of an engine. The shape of the aircraft here does not quite uh, throw any promise of accommodating a radial kind of engine. So, those are the various issues that uh, govern the choice of the arrangement of uh, engines and the kind of uh, engine uh, shape or arrangement that would be finally selected for aircraft. Uh, the number of cylinders is decided by the uh, kind of uh, power that is required, the amount of power that is required and this is to be decided by the uh, thrust that is required by the aircraft. So, to accommodate the aggregate power that is required, the number of cylinders can be increased. So, number of cylinders is decided by the thrust power that has to be delivered by the uh, powering uh, propeller. These are the pictures of the various uh, arrangement that we were talking about. This is typically an inline engine. As you can see now, they have been created in a shape that could in a very compact shape that could now go inside an aircraft and you could have your propeller mounted over here. And this is the opposed cylinder type where you have two over here and two on the other side and this is where your shaft is coming out which is the central shaft powered by all the cylinders and this would power your propeller. This is the V type where you can see one cylinder here and other on the other side and you have so many of them lined up okay, and they power the central shaft which is coming out over here. Okay and that runs the propeller. So, this is the arrangement which typically would go inside an aircraft um, and conforming to the aircraft streamline shape, uh, the low drag shape. This is a radial kind of propeller. As you can see here, there are so many of them uh, mounted in a radial formation and they have the central shaft and you can see here the propeller actually fixed to the engine. So, these are the various kinds of arrangements that have been used over the years. Uh, for example, these are the ones you are likely to see in small aircraft, these the upper two. You are more likely to see in the small aircraft which probably fly uh, two people or more than not more than four people. Whereas, the, uh, the lower ones you would probably see powering aircraft which fly maybe uh, six people or eight people and radial engine which accommodates more cylinders which means more power would typically be used for aircraft which fly more people something like 10, 12 people in one aircraft. Then we look at the various kinds of jet propulsion devices as have been used in last uh, 60 years or so. The first jet engine that is uh, recorded to have flown actually is the Henkel engine. Uh, created by Ohain uh, in Germany. However, Henkel engine is not the first uh, recorded jet engine. That credit goes to uh, is given now to Frank Whittle, even though historically it is pretty much uh, understood that the creation of Henkel engine by von Ohain and that by Frank Witt, uh, Whittle in England, von Ohain in Germany were going on simultaneously independent of each other and they came out with the engines almost uh, simultaneously in their respective countries. Uh, the Henkel engine flew, flew for the first time uh, with, on an aircraft. Whittle's engine actually flew a little later, 
this is the uh, Whittle's uh, engine which uh, he patented. You can see here uh, that he had all his concepts in place. It was based on a thermodynamic concept of cycle it, and it is supposed it is an heat engine. So, it is supposed to conform to a known cycle and he already had the idea that what kind of cycle he would use. These are the details of the engine in which he used actual compressor, he used a centrifugal compressor, which then supplied the air to the combustion chamber, which uh, drove an actual flow turbine, which in turn drives the compressors and then you have the jet over here, which uh, or exit nozzle, uh, which is supposed to finally, go out in a big jet to create the thrust. So, this is the conceptual uh, design, which Frank Whittle uh, finally patented uh, and was uh, granted the patent and that was supposed to be the historically the first patent granted for a jet engine. The kind of aircraft power plant that we have today, uh, there are many of them. Uh, we have just seen that the early 50 years, most of the aircraft were flown with uh, prist, what is known as piston props. That means, the piston engines powering propellers. Now, as soon as the jet engines came in, one of the varieties that immediately sprang up was what we known as, what we today known as uh, uh, turboprops. That means, these were the jet engines, but they were powering the propellers. Uh, that means, the jet thrust that was available was not the main thrust making device, but it is a propeller which creates a main thrust. However, immediately thereafter, the actual pure jet engine started coming and this is the thrust uh, characteristic of these three basic kind of engines, uh, all three of which are in operation even today. And as you can see here, as the flight Mach number increases uh, from 0 to let us say 0 0.75, which are still subsonic flights, the effectivity of the turboprops or the piston props or the propellers start going down. And somewhere around Mach 0 0.5, the effectivity of the propellers have gone down to the level that the turbojets become more and more effective means of uh, powering an aircraft. This was realized more than 50 years back and people wanted to fly higher, they wanted to fly faster and when flight of Mark 0.5 became imminent immediately after the World War II, most of the aircraft designers started looking for jet engines that would give them the necessary power to fly the aircraft at high speeds. Now, some of these are known today and uh, as a result of which most of the flight today at a higher flight Mach numbers are powered by jet engines. Most of the flights even today at lower flights Mach numbers are indeed still powered by propeller driven uh, power plants. So, uh, there is a clear divide here at low speed you would probably like to go with a propeller driven uh, power plant at high speed you would probably invariably look for uh, a pure jet engine or a turbojet engine to power your aircraft. If one stretches uh, a little more uh, uh, with the use of what is known as propulsive efficiency, which is actually a measure of the end usage of the available energy for final thrust creation. It is not same as uh, thermal efficiency or the overall efficiency of an engine as determined from the, from the thermodynamics. This is the propulsive efficiency that is how much of energy that is available at the end of the engine uh, uh, action that is, is finally converted to thrust. All the energy that is available for thrust making does not finally create thrust. So, this propulsive efficiency is the measure of the or efficiency of the end use of the available energy. Now, this uh, provides uh, a quick glimpse of what happens to various kinds of uh, engines. The turboprop, uh, the ef efficiency can be very high at low flight Mach numbers. It peaks at somewhere around Mach 0 0.4 or 0 0.5 and then it starts dropping very fast. Okay? Uh, and then 
if you look at the jet engines and its variants the turbo fan engines they start rising and from flight Mach number 0.5 onwards they become competitive. Um, the modern variant of the propeller which is uh, some kind of a, a mix between propeller and fan is called prop fan and this prop fan extends the propeller utility a little more up to say Mach uh, 0.75 or 0.8 and makes keeps it in a competitive market after which again the turbo fans and the turbo jets would uh, need to be used to power the aircraft. So, these are uh, pretty much known today that if you have pure propeller your effectivity or efficiency would start growing down very fast, uh, very fast indeed around Mach 0.5 and with the modern prop fans, we will have a quick look at it today. You can extend it to around 0.75, but thereafter inevitably its efficiency would start going down. And one of the reasons the propellers uh, suffer from the efficiency uh, defect is because the flow over the propellers, uh, we have seen they are made of airfoils, the flow of the airfoils do become supersonic. The airfoils that are used in propellers uh, cannot negotiate those supersonic flows in rotating formation and as a result of which the efficiency starts dropping due to the appearance of the shock waves due to the supersonic flow. In the prop fans that are used uh, in the modern uh, uh, aircraft and you would probably see more and more of them in the years to come, some of the supersonic flow has been uh, accommodated, uh, a low supersonic flow has been accommodated but even today uh, a high supersonic flow or clear supersonic flows cannot be accommodated through the rotating uh, propellers and as a result of which the efficiency drop starts appearing and hence you would need to use a variety of jet engine either pure jet or turbo jet to power your aircraft. The use of prop fans and also called prop jets. Uh, extend the use of the propellers to high uh, Mach numbers and this extension has been uh, possible by redesigning the propellers with new kind of aerofoils. Uh, when we go to the propeller chapter, we will probably have a look at those aerofoils, um, what allows them to uh, negotiate uh, higher Mach numbers uh, as they are flowing over the propeller blades, which as I mentioned could actually go supersonic. As a result of which the jet propulsion became more and more important specifically after the World War II and today one of the prime means of aircraft flying around the world is the jet propulsion uh, which we will look at uh, more in the next class. Let us take a quick look at the fundamental issues that we are uh, bothered with here. The thrust generation as we have seen is by using the Newton's second law and this creates uh, the thrust which is finally equated to the mass of air and the acceleration. We, we can now rewrite that as mass flow and change of velocity and this is the mass flow that we have. Now, this mass flow if it is very high and the change of velocity is indeed very small, what we have are what we call propellers. A very high mass of activation is what the propellers do with a very small change in velocity. On the other hand, a very large change of momentum or acceleration is created by the jet engines, which actually operate with a very low mass of activation. So, very small mass is activated through a large change of momentum is what is jet engines. A very high mass of air activated through a very small change of momentum is what the propellers do. So, typically a propeller uh, would operate with air mass flow, which could be of the order of 30 to 40 times more than that of a jet engine of the same size. So, the propellers and the jet engines operate on same principle, but they use the air mass in different ways. This is a typical modern propeller. It has large propeller. As you can see here, the propeller body is much larger than the engine body. Okay, so, it is actually geared to use a large amount of air mass. On the other hand, uh, a modern prop fan as I mentioned 
and we shall study this later afterwards uses a propeller which is mounted the rear of the engine and you can see here two propellers you can see here the propeller is still very big compared to the size of the engine in the next class we will have a look at a modern jet engine we shall look at the various uh, components of the jet engine how they function and finally how they create thrust by using all these components together in a matched manner so that finally we have a net uh, change of momentum which finally creates a thrust that makes an aircraft fly and we shall cover the modern jet engines or various kinds of jet engines in the next class.